What an awful mistake they make for our benefit. As a matter of justice to them, we should respond with resolutions of thanks and gratitude. Thousands of people who have never before heard of our papers are now inquiring for and insisting upon seeing them. They've succeeded only in arousing curiosity in our literature and propaganda. And woe to him who reads socialist literature from curiosity. He is surely a goner. I have known of a thousand experiments, but never one that failed. John M. Work, you know John, now the editorial staff of the Milwaukee Leader. When I first knew him, he was a lawyer out in Iowa. The capitalists out there become alarmed because of the rapid growth of the socialist movement. And they said we have to find some able fellow to fight this menace. They concluded that John Work was the man for the job, and they said to him, John, you're a bright young lawyer. You have a brilliant future before you. We want to engage you to find out all you can about socialism and to proceed to counteract its baneful effects and check its further growth. John at once provided himself with socialist literature and began his study of the Red Menace, and with the result that after he had read and discussed and digested a few volumes, he was a full-fledged socialist and had been fighting for socialism ever since. How stupid and short-sighted the ruling class really is. Cupidity is stone blind. It's got no vision. The greedy profit seeker, seeking exploiter, cannot see beyond the end of his nose. He can see a chance for an opening. He is cunning enough to know what graft is and where it is and how it can be secured. But vision he has none, not the slightest. He knows nothing of the great throbbing world that spreads out in all directions. He has no capacity for literature, no appreciation of art, no soul for beauty. That's the penalty the parasites pay for the violation of the laws of life. The Rockefellers are blind. Every move they move, make in their game of greed but hastens their own doom. They blow. Every blow they strike at the socialist movement reacts upon themselves. Every time they strike at us, they hit themselves. It never fails. Every time they strangle a socialist paper, they add a thousand voices proclaiming the truth of the principles of socialism and the ideas of the socialist movement. They help us in spite of themselves. Socialism is a growing idea and expanding philosophy is spreading over the entire face of the earth. It is as vain to resist it as it would be to arrest the sunrise on the morrow. It is coming, coming, coming all along the line. Can you not see it? If not, I advise you to consult an oculus. There is certainly something the matter with your vision. It's the mightiest movement in the history of mankind. What a privilege to serve it. I have regretted a thousand times that I can do so little for the movement that has done so little for me. So much. <laughs> I have regretted a thousand times. I... <laughs> I have regretted a thousand times that I can do so little for the movement that has done so much for me. The little that I am, the little that I am hoping to be, I owe to the socialist movement has given me my ideas, and ideas, my principles and convictions, and I would not exchange one of them for all the Rockefellers' blood-stained dollars. It's taught me how to serve, a lesson to me of priceless value. It's taught me the ecstasy and the hand clasp of a comrade. It has enabled me to hold high communion with you. It made it possible for me to take my place side by side with you in the great struggle for the better day, to multiply myself over and over again, to thrill with a fresh born manhood, to feel a life truly worthwhile, to open new avenues of vision, to spread out glorious vistas, to know that I am kin to all the throbs, all that throbs. To be class conscious and to realize that regardless of nationality, race, creed, color, sex, every man, every woman who toils, who renders useful service every member of the working class without an exception is my comrade, my brother and sister, and that to serve them in their cause is the highest duty of my life, and in their service I can feel myself expand, I can rise to the stature of man and claim the right to a place on earth, a place where I can stand and strive to speed the day of industrial freedom and social justice. Yes, my comrades, my heart is attuned to yours. Ah, all our hearts now throb as one great heart response to the battle cry of the social revolution here in this alert and aspiring assemblage our hearts are with the Bolsheviki of Russia. These heroic men and women, these oh, those unconquerable comrades have by their incomparable valor and sacrifice added fresh luster to the fame of the international movement. Those Russian comrades of ours have made greater sacrifices, have suffered more and have shed more heroic blood than any like member of men and women anywhere on earth. They've laid the foundation for, of the first real democracy that it, ever drew the breath of life in this world and the very first act of the triumphant Russian revolution was to proclaim a state of peace with all mankind coupled with a fervent moral appeal not to kings not to emperors rulers or diplomats but to the people of all nations here we had the very breath of democracy the quintessence of the dawning freedom the Russian revolution proclaimed its glorious triumph 
and it's ringing an inspiring appeal to the peoples of all the earth in a humane and fraternal spirit new russia emancipated at last from the curse of the centuries called upon all nations engaged in the frightful war the central powers as well as the allies to send representatives to a conference to lay down terms of peace that should be just and lasting here is a supreme opportunity to strike a blow to make the world safe for democracy. Was there any response to that noble appeal that in some day to come will be written in letters of gold in the history of the world? Was there any response whatever to that appeal for universal peace? No, not the slightest attention was paid to it by the Christian nations engaged in the terrible slaughter. It has been charged that Lenin and Trotsky and the leaders of the revolution were treacherous. They made a treacherous peace with Germany. Let us consider that proposition briefly. At the time of the revolution, Russia had been three years in the war, World War I. Under the, the Tsar, she had lost more than four million of her ill-clad, poorly equipped, half-starred soldiers, slain outright or disabled on the field of battle. She was absolutely bankrupt. Her soldiers were mainly without arms. This is what was bequeathed to the revolution by the Tsar and his regime. And for this condition, Lenin and Trotsky were not responsible, nor the Bolsheviki. For this appalling state of affairs, the Tsar and his rotten bureaucracy was solely responsible. When the Bolsheviki came into power and went through the archives, they found they exposed the secret treaties, the treaties that were made between the Tsar and the French government, the British government, and the Italian government. Proposed and after victory was achieved to dismember the German Empire and destroy the central powers. These treaties have never been denied nor repudiated. Very little has been said about them in the American press. I have a copy of these treaties showing that the very purpose of the Allies is exactly the purpose of the Central Powers, and that is conquest and spoilation of the weaker nations has always been the purpose of war. Which is true. Eugene Debs is right. World War I, they tried to carve Germany up, wipe it off the face of the map, and because they tried to destroy it with the strong reparations, all came out of those ashes of oppression, Adolf Hitler. If Americans would have listened to Eugene Debs in 1917 and 1918, 1918, June 16, 1918, we would not have had an Adolf Hitler. America, you need to recognize your heroes and your champions. You keep on missing out on them. Either they're getting shot from out on your knee or you're not electing them and you let the media mock them and make fun of them. If someone's talking the truth to you, even if you disagree with them, respect it's the truth. Respect that it's the truth. Okay? I would vote for Jill Stein over any Tea Party candidate any day of the week. But when Ron Paul talks about the war and talks about the Patriot Act and talks about the war on drugs, I appreciate his stances on that issue. He is more anti-war on drugs, anti-empire wars, an anti-war uh, by the police that I appreciate him speaking the truth. I, I appreciate him saying those things. And unfortunately, the Democrat leadership, there's hardly any Democrats who are doing this. So, that's what the Allies wanted to do. They just wanted to dismember the German Empire and destroy the Central Powers. Uh, the treaties that were made by the Tsar of Russia and the French government and British government and the Italian government. So, no one's ever denied them. The exact purpose of the war was the conquest and spoilation of the weaker nations, which has always been the purpose of the war. Wars throughout history have been waged for conquest and plunder. In the Middle Ages, when the feudal lords who inhabited the castles whose towers may still be seen along the Rhine concluded to enlarge their domains to increase their power, their prestige, and their wealth, they declared war upon one another. But they themselves do not go to war any more than the modern feudal lords. The barons of Wall Street go to war. The feudal barons of the Middle Ages, the economic predecessors of the capitalists of our day, declared all the wars. And their miserable serfs fought all the battles. The poor, ignorant serfs have been taught to revere their masters, to believe that when their masters declare war upon one another, it is their patriotic duty to fall upon one another and to cut one another's throats for the profit and glory of the lords and barons who held them in contempt. And that's war in a nutshell. The master class has always declared the wars. The subject class has always fought the battles. The master class has had all to gain and nothing to lose, while the subject class has had nothing to gain and all to lose, especially their lives. They have taught, always taught and trained you to believe it to be your patriotic duty to go to war, to have yourself slaughtered at their command. But in all 
the history of the world, you the people have never had a voice in declaring war. And strange as it certainly appears, no war by any nation in any age has ever been declared by the people. And here let me emphasize that fact. It cannot be repeated too often that the working class who fight all the battles, the working class who make the supreme sacrifices, the working class who freely shed their blood and furnish the corpses have never yet had a voice in either declaring war or making peace. It is the ruling class that invariably does both. They alone declare war and they alone make peace. Yours not to reason why, yours but to do and die. That is their motto and we object on the part of the awakening workers of this nation. If war is right, let it be declared by the people. You who have their, your lives to lose, you certainly above all others have the right to decide the momentous issue of peace or war. Rose Pastor Stokes. Rose Pastor Stokes. And when I mention her name, I take off my hat. Here we have another heroic and inspiring comrade. She had her millions of dollars at command. Did her wealth restrain her an instant? On the contrary, her supreme devotion to the cause outweighed all considerations of a financial or social nature. She went out boldly to plead the cause of the working class, and they rewarded her high courage with a ten-year sentence to the penitentiary. Think of it, ten years, what atrocious crimes she had committed. What frightful things had she said, let me answer you candidly. She said nothing more than I've said here afternoon. Nothing more than what I have said here this afternoon. I want to admit, I want to admit without reservation that if Rose Pastor Stokes is guilty of the crime, so am I. If she is guilty for the brave part she has taken in this testing time of human souls, I would not be cowardly enough to plead my innocence. If she ought to be sent to the penitentiary for ten years, so ought I without a doubt. What did Rose Pastor Stokes say? Why, she said that a government could not at the same time serve both profiteers and the victims of the profiteers. And is this not true? Can a government both serve the profiteers and the victims of the profiteers? Certainly. Certainly. This is not possible. No one can successfully dispute it. Roosevelt said a thousand times more in the very same paper, the Kansas City Star. Roosevelt said vauntingly the other day that he would be hurt if he went to jail. He knows very well that he has taken no risk of going to jail. He is shrewdly laying his wires for the Republican nomination in 1920. And he is an adept at making the appeal of the demagogue. He would do anything to discredit the Wilson administration that he may give himself and his party all credit. That's the only rivalry there is between the two old capitalist parties. The Republican Party and the Democratic Party. The political twins of the master class. They are not going to have any friction between them this fall. They are all patriots in this campaign. They are not going to combine to prevent the election of any disloyal socialist. I've never heard anyone tell of any difference between these corrupt capitalist parties. Do you know of any? I certainly don't. The situation is that one is in and the other trying to break in, and that is substantially the only difference between them. Rose Pastor Stokes never uttered a word. She did not have a legal constitutional right to utter, but her message to the people, the message that stirred their thoughts and opened their eyes, that must be suppressed. Her voice must be silenced. And so she was prompted, promptly subjected to a mock trial and sentenced to the penitentiary for 10 years. Her conviction was a foregone conclusion. The trial of a socialist in the capitalist court is at best a farcical affair. What ghost of a chance had she in a court with a packed jury? The corporation tool on the bench, not the least in the world. And so she goes to the penitentiary for 10 years if they carry out their brutal and disgraceful, graceful program. For my part, I do not think they will. In fact, I feel sure they will not. If the war were over tomorrow, the prison doors would open to our people. They simply mean to silence the voice of protest during the war. What a compliment it is to be, it is to the social, socialist movement to be thus persecuted for the sake of the truth. The truth alone will make the people free, and for this reason that truth must not be permitted to reach the people. The truth has always been dangerous to the rule of the rogue, the exploit of the robber. So the truth must be ruthlessly suppressed. That is why they are trying to destroy the socialist movement, and every time they strike a blow, they add a thousand new voices to the host, proclaiming that socialism is the hope of humanity, and has come to emancipate the people from their final form of servitude. How good this sip of cool water from the hand of a comrade. It is refreshing, as if it were out on the desert waste. How good it is to look into your glowing faces this afternoon. You are really good looking to me, I assure you, and I am glad there are so many of you. Your tribe has increased amazingly since first I came here. You used to be so few and far between. A few years ago when you struck a town, the first thing you had to do was to see if you could locate a socialist. And you were pretty lucky if you struck the trail of one before you left town. 
if he happened to be the only one and he was still living, he was now regarded as a prisoner of Pathfinder. He pulls a place of honor in your esteem and his lodgment in the hearts of all who come after him. It's far different now. You can hardly throw a stone in the dark without hitting a socialist. They're everywhere, increasing numbers. And what marvelous changes are taking place amongst the people. Occupy Louisville. 